Hey there and welcome to the Code Wrinkles channel. If you follow me for some time, you may know that I'm not the biggest fan of just using libraries in our projects because they exist and we can use them. I really think that adding a library to a project also adds technical depth that we need to take into consideration and repay it at a certain point. But this being said, I'm not a caveman and obviously I also use libraries. And if I would like to start a new project, these are the three libraries that I would start with in each project. And I will start from the last one and I would go to the first one, which I think is the most important library for me and I wouldn't drop it only if it is really necessary. So let's get started and at number three is Fluent Validation. Now, I think that Fluent Validation is a really powerful library and it allows you to do very quickly a lot of different stuff and it allows you to do validation in different places of your project very easily. In this project, I have already installed this Fluent Validation library, as you can see here. And in the Models folder, I have this very basic payment class. Creating a validator with Fluent Validation is actually very easy. You just need to inherit this abstract validator interface that is also generic and you specify the type for which you want to perform the validation. To configure the validations, you just need to implement a constructor and in the constructor, you can then add the different validation rules. For instance, I would like to have a validation that says that the ID should be greater than zero. So nothing easier than this. We have this rule for then this P is obviously a product because this is the generic type parameter. And then we say that the ID should be greater than zero. So very fluently. We can also add another rule for the validation in this case for the payer property, which is a string. And we say that if we don't want it to be empty, we don't want it to be null, and we want to have this a minimum length of 5 and a maximum length of 50. And obviously we can also add the validation also with this rule 4 for the amount that it should be greater than 0. Why I think that this library is actually very powerful is that I can fully use it for instance in my domain model if I use the static factory methods like this one, I can then create a payment, then I can create the validator and I use the validator to validate my payment and I will get back a validation result, which is actually a very complex and nice object that helps me or gives me a lot of different insights into what exactly the problem with the validation was. So I could easily do something like this. I want to verify is my validation result is not valid. And in that case, I have these errors list and I can iterate through this list and for each one I would just write in the console in this case what exactly the problem is and then I will throw an exception. And if everything goes well and my validation is okay then I would simply just return my payment. And if you want to use the same validator for instance in ASP.NET Core directly or if you want to use it maybe in mediator handlers or wherever you want to use it through dependency injection nothing easier than this to just add the validator as a scope service and this means that it is available for dependency injection whenever you might need it for instance we could go to this payment controller and here simply inject our validator and if we want to run a manual validation for instance of the payment that requests in the body nothing easier than that we just use the validator that we get through dependency injection and we validate and if we receive a bad request or if we, if we receive errors or that the validation did not pass, then we simply just can return the bad request with this validation result, which obviously will contain all the different error messages. Now, don't take this that I would advise you to do here manual validation of your bodies that you get in APIs, because for this you have model binding and you have the default validation mechanism in ASP.NET Core that usually is quite okay, but you can use the exact same way to use this validator, for instance, to validate your commands in a mediator handler, because in that case you would inject the validator in the handler itself and do do the validation of the command there. So the main point here is that you can easily have this I validator or the fluent validation in dependency injection and use it whenever you might need it. Cool. Now that we have this behind us, let's move to number two. And here there is a library that is used for logging and this is Serilog. And guys, Serilog is from my point of view, very, very powerful, very configurable, and actually very easy to use. To get started with Serilog, what the only code that you would need to write is to just come here and say builder host use Serilog, and then you get the context, the host hosting context, and the configuration for the logger for the Serilog logging. And here you can, for instance, say that in the configuration for the logger, I want to read configuration from, 
and I want to read it from a configuration file and I provide the configuration from the host, which means that I can read it from appsettings.json. And one important thing here is if I go to manage NuGet packages is to understand exactly that Serilog actually has different libraries. And there is this Serilog ASP.NET Core library that I have installed as the first one because I am using in this case Serilog in an ASP.NET Core application. You can also install the default or the regular just Serilog package if you want to use it, for instance, in .NET Framework or in other type of .NET applications that are not tied to ASP.NET Core. The other thing is that it's provide or the core package provides you just the ability to do the logging, like with structure logging in a very nice way and very configurable and easy to use way. But you also need to send the logs to some other places. In Serilog, these are called syncs. So we would have a sync for the console, which would be responsible to send the logs that we want to the console. But then we can have a different sync for file. And in this case, it would simply write the logs that we write in our application to a file that we provide or for which we would provide the configuration. And like that, depending on where exactly you would like to log, you can add a sync for that. There's virtually a Serilog sync for anything that you can think of. Obviously, in this example, I would just want to write my logs to the console and to a file. So the thing is, I said that this is the only code that we need to write, but we need to configure obviously Serilog and we said that we can configure this via app settings to JSON. Now to configure Serilog is not something that is really trivial. There is a lot of different stuff that you can configure. And to be honest, if you ask me if I remember everything or each type of the configuration that you can have in Serilog, I would say that, well, I really don't. So what you could do is just spend a few hours of researching documentation or stack overflow and starting to write everything here that you need in your app settings.json or you could take the easy way and use the help of our dear friend ChatGPT. So dear ChatGPT, please write me a Serilog JSON configuration for ASP.NET Core. Minimum log level should be information except for the logging starting with Microsoft. Those should be warning as a minimum. I also need things for console and file. Also write to console with the name console and write to file with the name file and using bin log txt as args for life path. So let's see if ChatGPT can help us and write for us a serial configuration just in a matter of very few seconds. And ChatGPT also writes us some explanations about what we have in this configuration file. But what I would like to do here is let's just copy everything what we have in the serial configuration. Let's go to our application. Let's go to our JSON file and just write everything down. So if we take a look here, what it has done and well, working with serial before, I kind of like know that this uh, this might actually just work out of the box, like using with the using you actually define exactly the things that you want to use in your Serilog environment right now. Then with the minimum level, or obviously we define the minimum level, which is the information, but we want to override what we have as default. And we say that for Microsoft, it should be warning. And then we have this write to array in which we specify exactly all the things to which we want to write. And here we have one for the console. It also created us some arguments where it kind of like provided some themes for the for the console output and how the time uh, timestamp should be formatted and the same thing for the file. And then it also uh, did some enrichers here with from load context and with machine name and with user environment username. Now these enrichers, I guess they won't be available by default. I would have to, to, to install them, but we can already just run the application. So the first thing that we noticed is that we don't have the default logs from Microsoft, which means that Serilog is already working. But if I go here and just try this out, you can see that I have a warning failed to determine the HTTPS port for redirect. This is because I had HTTPS redirection and this is a warning coming from a Microsoft logger, but it's a warning, so I get it. And then we have this information request received by controller and the names of the controller and the action that was called. And if we take a look, that's actually what we have in the controller right here, a very basic logging when the request comes into this action method. And if we go here to the bin directory, we can see that also we have a log.txt file. And if we look into this log.txt file, we have exactly the same things that we also have in our logger. So let's move on now and go to number one. And this might not be a surprise for a lot of you, but the library that I actually think is the most useful and that I would use in really each project that I start with is Mediator. 
And Mediator is a great library, but not for this idea of having a request and a request handler, which a lot of times is misconsidered to be a CQRS implementation, which is obviously not from my point of view. But the main or the core principle here is that, yeah, we have this idea of request which is this create product, which is an I request, but then we also have this I request handler and we just implement here a very simple handler. But this could easily be recreated also by ourselves if we would to use just this simple functionality. So it's nothing really too complicated on that. However, what I think it is very useful when it comes to Mediator are two features that are fundamental, and these are the behavior pipelines and the notifications. Now, on behavior pipelines, I have done a video quite a short time ago, so I leave the link to it in the description below. You can check it out if you haven't watched it already. But the core idea is that it's actually great to use Mediator pipeline behaviors to move cross-cutting concerns. Now, the idea is that, for instance, we have created this logging behavior in which we obviously want to implement logging in each request. So we just need to implement this iPipeline behavior interface of T request and T response. And as part of this interface, we need to implement this handle method. Now you need to think about this mediator pipeline behaviors very similar or in very similar terms to what we have as middleware in ASP.NET Core. So you have the handler and you can wrap around the handler these different pipeline behaviors. And that's why we have this next delegate that we have in each handler. So it means that this logger will execute before actually the handler will be executed. And this one will write this log after the handler has been successfully executed. And then we just need to return the result back because this is the default or this is the signature of the method. And then the second very important feature of Mediator for which I think that it's really important are notifications. And for instance, I have here this product created class and this product created implements this iNotification interface, which is from Mediator. And for each notification, we can implement one or several different handlers. So in this case, let's assume that when we create a product, we also want to send an email to somebody and we also write to send an SMS to somebody. So what we'll do here in this case, we would create two different handlers for the same notification. The first one is this send email on product created and the second is send SMS on product created. So both implement this iNotification handler, which is generic and takes the notification as a generic type param. But in each notification, we perform actually different tasks. Obviously, in this case, it is a very simple thing because we just write things to the console. But here you would implement everything that you need, maybe with an external service to just send an email and to send an SMS. Now, if we go back in the handler, we see that here in the handler, we inject the mediator. And when we want to send these notifications, like here, the product was created, let's assume, and we say await mediator publish. And we publish this new product created and provide also the cancellation token. And it means that it will execute both of the notification handlers. Now, there is one thing that you can't know exactly what is the order in which the handlers or which, which the notification handlers will be executed. So that's a downside for it, but still you have a guarantee that all the handlers will be executed. So what do you think about these three picks? Would you pick exactly the same libraries? Or if you need to create a similar classification, which would be your top three libraries that you might use in every .NET project? Please leave a comment below and I am really curious to understand exactly what are the preferred libraries of each of you and what are you actually using the most like libraries that you couldn't live without. And if you enjoyed this video, don't forget to hit the thumbs up button and subscribe to this channel if you're for the first time here. If you have any question or if you just want to get in touch with me, don't be shy and head over to the comment section and leave a comment and I would be more than happy to get in touch with you. This being said, Thank you very much for watching and until the next time, I wish you the very best.